application. There are certain properties for these applications that we need to, to think about to be able to use this visual as well. And I want to talk about uh, break it down into why it's why distributed and, and what the high truth computing part is. The high truth computing, I'm starting with the backwards, starting with the high truth computing. And really what it is, is uh, uh, we define it as thinking about how much computation we can do over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. We talk about months or years. I mean, this is you know, not hours, right? And um, and it turns out that this kind of mindset makes uh, it fits really well with how we do the science. We are more, you know, we're less concerned about you know how fast our application is running at any given time. We're more concerned about um, actually, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Just in the computer. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're more concerned about, for example, will we have enough computing power to finish our computations before the next paper that like? So that's uh, so that, that fits pretty well with how we work in, in science. So what's the relationship between high computing and high performance computing? Well, we've heard both heard both of those terms this morning. High truth computing, uh, well, and, and let me tell you, for start by saying that they are not mutually exclusive. But it turns out that we see uh, kind of workloads fitting uh, one of them, uh, they fit in one of the bins. Uh, so for the high truth computing, we see mostly serial jobs, maybe low core count credit or parallel, or low, low core count, count uh, parallel jobs. And in high performance computing, well, we actually have the large FPI jobs, large uh, runs, mm -hmm. single, single parallel job runs. Um, and of course, in high performance computing, with a great performance over a relatively short period of time, you know, we did this job, we did my queue for a while, one job run was really, really well. In high performance computing, we uh, have you know, more continuous uh, stream of jobs running, and there's really, you know, the, the amount of resources have to go up and down, but it is a continuous stream of resources. So just uh, driving home that point a little bit, when we talk about high, high performance computing applications, we usually measure them in blocks, floating point operations per second. And you can't just multiply these blocks out to get floating point operations per year. And this is a made up, um, you know, floppy that's a, a made up term here, a made up in the unit. But the point is that you know if you have NPI jobs or large NPI jobs, and you're not going to be able to keep them running 24/7 for a whole year, for example, that's just not going to happen. And, and therefore, also in 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 the high computing, we're not really using blobs or floppies. Instead, we're using uh, like our unit of computation is the CPU hour. So you will hear us talk about how many CPU hours people got over a month or a year. And that it's not an exact unit because it doesn't take account, for example, uh, how fast that CPU is. But on average, you know, a general CPU uh, hour uh, on all speed, that's the unit. So going back to the why it's distributed. And we have seen this map a couple of times now. This is the size of no speed. It'll obviously geographically distributed. There's the way it computes resources spread out over the whole country. Uh, but distributed in this case doesn't only mean geographically distributed. It also means that they are uh, hosted at different universities, at different network layers, there are different uh, administrators, different site policies. So even though uh, you know, Open Science Grid is a consortium, not all the resources will look exactly the same or will have exactly the same properties. So that's something to think about when we're running jobs. I think the key here is to be flexible. You know, you have to have a job, and uh, we want it to work uh, well on different resources. So having having flexible jobs is, is key. The biggest uh, drawback with that distributed system in this case, well, there's no shared files and stuff. And uh, this is different from what you have seen on campus resources. You know, on campus resources, you used to be able to compile your software, uh, put it in a shared file system, and put the data in there, and have it accessible from all the, the nodes that your job might be running on. And 
on a distributed system like the open science grid, you will not have that. So you have to be able to um, bring applications or access to applications in a different way and save the data, how to handle data and when, when, when there's no shared process. There's a small exception we're going to talk about later on, uh, called the issues, which is a legal name file system for software. So specifically, and, and all this is going to be covered in detail again, uh, later on. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about the data for applications, but just actually the software. You basically have two, um, two solutions to that. And one is to bring that application with your job. This is a flexible way. Uh, you know, you can quickly issue new software updates if you have you know, page executable, for example. But it also means that the application has to be self-contained. It means that you have to be able to build it or link it, and, or or have a you know Python script, for example, that is and um, that doesn't have dependencies on uh, a lot of system uh, or or other libraries. So, uh, but if you can pull that off. Bringing the software is a really nice way because it's, uh, uh, it allows you the uh, freedom. Uh, no, the other option is to install it on Oasis. The downside there is that this, this is a shared file system, a read only shared file system. Um, the downside is that currently only admins have rights to install software in this file system. The turnaround times can be longer if you have to go and ask people to, to deploy software updates and things like that. Uh, and I think we'll cover both of them, right? Is that right? So we'll be doing places so far as well. Okay. Right. Um, so talking about how the application should behave. Well, the best case is if it's single threaded, if it uses less, less than two gigs of RAM, and have a run time between four and twelve hours. And these are more guidelines than rules. So for example, single threaded. Well, we can support multi-threaded, small core count, and PI jobs. Uh, small core count in this case means that they are small enough to fit in one node. So it's like 12 cores for the core core, so then we can, we can find. And um, use that in two weeks of RAM. Well, that's the default case. If you submit a job without any kind of modifiers, uh, two weeks is, is what you would expect to get uh, access to per core. And uh, there is ways of of, uh, of requesting more memory, but if you request more memory, well, the target pool that the resources that you can get is going to get smaller. So you will probably have a lower throughput uh, if you request more memory. And the runtime of four to twelve hours. Well, uh, if you have short jobs, as they say, say five, ten seconds of short but long jobs, um, what will happen is that there's an overhead scheduled in these jobs. And it's, it's not much overhead, like a couple of seconds, three seconds, whatever. But it's big enough that you are going to be noticing that in, in, uh, in throughput. So um, what we want to do is we want to have you know, a couple hours or four hours of, of runtime for the job. Because that means that all the scheduling and trans data transfers and all that stuff, we, we don't have to worry about that. That's not an overhead of like four hours. Long jobs. Uh, that's a different problem. And all of them, so. Short jobs, the other thing we can do with short jobs, if you do have them, we can cluster them together. So we can create a bigger job from a bunch of small jobs and, and, and work uh, with that instead. Long jobs is a different problem. <coughs> and the, the biggest problem I have is preemption. So this is something that will happen on OSP. Preemption is when your job gets killed on a remote resource. And again, this is something that um, if you have the using campus resources, for example, uh, it sounds pretty insane that somebody would come around and kill jobs on for you. But what happens is that you're writing on other people's resources. And those people might have a different uh, priority than, than the, the, you know, you might be low on their priority list. So for example, if you are as a Duke student, the Duke uh, staff faculty runs jobs on a different resource, let's say Nebraska. If Nebraska, you sit there and you run your job and it is running five for a few hours, another a local user, a local Nebraska user submits a job. That resource might decide that the local Nebraska user running a Nebraska resource and will have you know, priority on the resource. 
and it will kick you off by, by killing your dog and give that resource to, um, to the local Nebraska research staff. So uh, this happens, and it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And the scheduler we're using will, will restart your job, and you, don't, you won't even notice it, except that your, your dog one time in the long way. But uh, it's important to understand that the job has to be able to restart quickly. And for a lot of the jobs, it's not a problem. If you just have you know, simple, out, simple input and simple output, it, it's fine. But if your job, for example, goes out and, and connects the database and updates state in that database, you won't have a problem. Because the next time that job restarts, well, the state will be out of sync. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's going to be a problem. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so this was just my last slide. I just want to say that uh, you know, after this meeting, there is a, a, a support mailing list, and it's on this uh, website as well somewhere. And, and uh, so if you have questions in uh, these few days, come and talk to us. And uh, after those few days, there is the, the meeting list to, to post questions. So any questions on the high of publication uh, properties? Jobs. Uh, it depends on if your job requires as much as 10 gigabytes of memory. So there are resources that will support that. What will happen is that um, you, will, you, will, you will mark your job as a 10 gig job. And uh, the schedule will go out to try to find a resource. That, that, you know. But the number of computer nodes, for example, that has 10 gigs of, of, of RAM, and the number of sites that are willing to you know, share that resource, you know, that, that it becomes a pretty small pool of resources we will have, uh, have access to. So, you know, it might just be like, you know, maybe you can run 10 jobs instead of 1,000. I don't know. But, you know, it will be a smaller number of jobs. And there's enough to limit to as well. I don't, I think 10 gigs would be okay, but, you know, at some point, you, know, you won't find any jobs that they will be able to. Probably the same thing applies to really long jobs. Yeah. The long jobs, I mean, there is, you can do checkpointing. We, do, we recommend to do application level checkpointing, but the system wants to getting a little bit sketchy in a distributed environment. Uh, but if, if you have an application that, that needs to run long, if you can write out state every now and then and have that job be able to restart to that state, then 